All right, so I'm Erin Plu. I'm uh, the North Idaho Program Manager for Trout Unlimited, um, and I have been helping to coordinate the Priest River Watershed Group. And um, today, we've been going through a whole kind of series of informational sessions that are aimed at kind of giving the steering committee and the rest of the public just the basics on the priest watershed. And so we're kind of in the, in the beginning. So we're kind of building our knowledge base so we all have a shared understanding of what we're talking about. And um, so, so these uh, conversations today are kind of at a base level. We're, we're starting at the bottom and building up. So um, this might be an introduction to something that we go further into and have more sessions on. So, um, I'm going to try to keep things moving along. Each speaker has about a half an hour, and at the end, we'll have time for questions. Um, if they go under half an hour, I might take a couple questions right after them. And the first speaker today is going to be Michelle Richmond, and she is the Northern Regional Manager for Idaho Department of Water Resources. And to be clear, for today, I've asked her to talk a little bit about the history of Outlet Dam and the structure itself, the physical structure and how it's changed over time. Uh, a little bit about the current operations of Outlet Dam and the recent modifications that have occurred and what, the, we, what actually physically was modified and um, what the outcomes of that, what the goals of that are. As Aaron said, I'm the Northern Regional Manager for the Coeur d'Alene office. We have uh, 14 people right now, 16 when we're fully staffed. We do a lot of work with water rights and adjudication of historical water rights with the public. And we have a couple other different programs that we run out of our region. Uh, our region goes down to Grangeville and up to the Canadian border and then to the state borders east and west. So, pretty big region. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is my pointer. <laughs> We're high tech. <laughs> so before we get started, I, I wanted to ask, um, how many of you saw the first original dam being constructed in 1950? Anybody? No? Okay. I was thinking maybe a couple. <laughs> How many of you saw it, the dam going in in 1978? Okay, and I imagine everybody here has seen the dam though, is that right? Yeah, okay. Anyway, if you have, if anyone has photos of the first dam, the timber one, I'd love to see those. Our files are sparse, our archives for that first dam. We have pictures of this gate or that leak, but not the whole thing, so. As I launch into the talk, I wanna convey that the focus will be on the history of the dam, and I'll start with what the circumstances were before the dam went in, and then what led to the installation of the first dam, and then what led to the replacement, and then I'll describe some uh, guidance and operations that have been used over time and then I'll discuss what happened in 2015. Oh, I'm not doing the... No, whoop. Have to let you know. I have to let you know. Okay, so what happened in 2015, and then I'll jump into the hydrology a little bit. Okay, next. So before I talk about the pre-dam era, I would like to um, point out Roy Peckham and Bruce Levitt in the back. They are, yeah, they are the current operators of the Priest Lake Outlet Dam. And between the two of them, they're able to put eyes on the dam and the river every day. So back uh, to the slide, the two photos on the left are taken from the University of Idaho photo collection and they show men working on a log jam on the Priest River in 1940. The two photos on the right are 
of the Diamond Match Lumber Mill at the Priest Lake Outlet. That was also taken in the 1940s. And Roy Peckham helped me piece together the history. He's got a personal connection. Uh, the source of the photos is a book called uh, Wild Place, History of Priest Lake, Idaho. And the original mill was established in 1942, and it was actually owned by Roy's grandfather by marriage, Sue's grandfather, his wife, and he sold the mill to Diamond Match Company in 1946. And if you stand on the dam and look upstream into the outlet, you can still see the pilings that were used to catch and hold logs for that operation. Okay, next. A little bit about the pre-dam sentiment. On October 6th of 49, a state field engineer inspected the outlet and he issued his observations to the governor. Uh, he indicated that he observed a loss of depth and saw docks high and dry out of the water. So he, re he recommended construction of a low overflow dam near the lumber mill in the outlet to raise the lake to the natural Two feet, to raise the lake approximately two feet to its natural level. So the purpose would be to float logs and to enable passage of logs down the river. Later that month, whoops, later that month, the Priest Lake Sportsman and Resort Owner Association also issued a statement. They claimed that the logs in the outlet were gouging the stream banks and damaging uh, the banks, taking boulders and gravel and um, damaging the banks to the point that the, the outlet was lowered and causing uh, damage to the resort and private property owners. So they, they also saw docks up in the air and uh, dry areas with new swamps appearing so they indicated that the lake level was as low as it had been in history, according to them. They said, we feel a low dam placed below the mill will benefit Diamond Match and everyone on the lake and river. So at that point, things were set in motion, and by September of 1950, there was an easement in place for the dam. So next, so then we go into Idaho Code, and Idaho Code 70-501 was established in 1950 to authorize the existence of the dam. 502 authorized the construction to begin. 503, 4, 5, and 6 all had to do with funding and money appropriation. And then 507 is the one that required the lake level to be held between 0.1 and 3 feet. So the state then at that time, once the code was in place, approved plans for a temporary dam across the Priest River downstream of the Diamond Match Mill. Next. Okay, moving into the construction of the dam. It was constructed by Washington Water Power, and it was also operated by Washington Water Power on an annual basis, and in return for the benefit of downstream hydropower production, Washington Water Power paid money to the state. The state owned the dam, and let's go into the construction of the dam. It was uh, made of timber, it had 20 bays, and the photo's dark, but hopefully you can see the boards on the deck of the dam, and those boards were 12 inches tall, and they were slid into vertical slots and added and removed to change the lake level as needed. As you can imagine, removing and adding a board at a time was made the flow kind of jumpy and sudden, so the changes were noticed. Um, in this dam, I want to point out that the water flowed over the stop logs and checkboards. So as you can imagine, if a fish was swimming upstream toward the dam, 
it would encounter a barrier, and the height of that barrier would vary depending on how many of those boards were slid into place. Also, over the years, there was talk of hydropower uh, since the early 1900s and by various entities, and it was met with opposition. In a, in a 1958 letter from the state engineer to the governor, uh, it, it advised against hydropower, and the specific wording was, the almost universal position of all shore property owners is they are opposed to the Northern Lights, Inc. proposed power development in general because they believe it is infeasible and they are violently opposed to it if in any way it will change the pr present quite satisfactory control of the lake levels. Next. So moving on into the 1960s, an agreement was established between Northern Lights, Washington Water Power, and the state. And that was for the operations of the dam. Washington Water Power was to hold the dam consistent with statute to 0.1 to 3 feet. And river fluctuation would be held to a minimum per this agreement and the river flow should not drop below 60 CFS. This was the first appearance that I ran across in going through the archives of that 60 CFS. I don't, there was no explanation about how they arrived at that number, but that was the first occurrence of it that I saw. And then fall release was to occur on or before October 31st, but not before the Friday following Labor Day. And as a side note, throughout this presentation, you might notice that these recommended dates for fall release uh, tend to vary over the years and per the agreement. So in 1971, Northern Lights dropped out of the agreement for operations. Washington Water Power continued. In 1972, uh, Fish and Game issued a report with some suggestions. And the first one, or one of those, was the minimum flow should not be below 230 CFS. The release and fall should be gradual to minimize damage to aquatic life. And that the original dam had that, the sudden flow changes, so it might have been in response to that. Uh, to also to aim to have a zero feet of lake level by early November, November 1st, preferably. And in that report, they also suggested th the idea of having, holding more than three feet in the lake to have more to release in August or September. Also in 1972, there were a couple of hearings and they were held by, one was held by the Idaho Water Resources Board, and the other was held by the Idaho Department of Water Administration. Those two entities were separate in 1972. In 1974, they became under one umbrella called Idaho Department of Water Resources, which is what it is today. But in 1972, they both held their own hearings the board held the hearing to determine the extent of the concern over the Priest Lake outflow. The Department of Water Administration held theirs to hear public comment concerning past operation of the dam and then um, proposals to alter these practices. So in, by 1976, the state did uh, begin earlier drawdowns and they recommended to Washington Water Power to do so. And that's what this graph is showing. The hydrograph is from Idaho Fish and Game and it shows for 1976 that the drawdown was uh, mostly complete by early November. So things were starting to shift. And by the end of 1976, the dam was deemed to be in a state of disrepair and in need of replacement. So operations continued in the late 70s and early 80s from Washington Water Power. 
following similar guidelines with the 0.1 to 3 feet and then the 60 CFS minimum flow. In 1979, the concrete dam was completed. It was about 50 feet downstream of the old timber dam, and it was constructed by, I don't know how to say this, Goebel Construction of Spokane. It does have 11 radial gates, and in the photo we're looking upstream toward the dam, and you can see daylight behind the two gates on the left. So one thing I wanted to point out is the gate openings are at the base of the dam. That's a key difference from the timber dam. The, the gates move in a smooth, continuous motion around a point in a circular motion, and uh, in this way, fish passage could have some greater potential over the last dam, just with the openings at the base of the gate. Next. There were some uh, logistical changes to operations. So Washington Water Power operated the dam until 2002 and then Washington Water Power was replaced by Avista, who then continued to operate the dam through 2011. At that time, the Idaho Department of Water Resources took over the operations of the dam and uh, engaged in uh, contracting with locals such as Roy and Bruce to have their eyes on the dam every day and the river. Um, there was legislation in 2018 and the board became the new owner of the dam. The state had been the owner up until that point. So even with the board being the owner, Idaho Department of Water Resources continues to operate the dam with the contracted help. Now I'll go into spring gate operations. So. The hydrograph shows the, the oops, sorry. Yep. Hydrograph shows the lake level rising and peaking in May. In typical years, the gates are out of the water and we're waiting for runoff from the surrounding basin. Once the lake level has peaked, then gate operations are initiated to hold the lake at that summer level. Main takeaway here is that the timing and magnitude of the peak lake level depend on the timing and amount of runoff in the basin, and that's determined by Mother Nature. Okay, now moving into fall levels, fall release. Uh, this depends mostly on code, and I'll read an excerpt from the code. The lake level shall be held until the time after the close of the main recreational season as determined by said board prior to releasing it to the three feet, below three feet. So you can see that the language is broad and that allowed for several different uh, releases and timing over the years depending on the agreement or circumstances. For example, this year we'll be releasing uh, in anticipation of construction happening, we'll be releasing starting October 1. And uh, when we start on October 1, for example, in, uh, in 2021, we started on October 21 and it was complete. Lake level reached its natural level by November 1. So that was a whole month. Drawdown takes at least one month. And for much of that time, the gates are out of the water and the lake is draining. Fall release could be managed to be more gradual, but if that were to happen, then a start date would need to happen before October 20 or October 1st to be able to be done by November 1st. So we do have flexibility in the gate operations. For instance, if we know that we need to have four feet of gate opening as operators, we, just, we know the four feet is a given, 
we could either do that all in one gate, this is just an example, or two gates with two feet each, or four gates with one foot each. If one configuration was more conducive to fish passage than another, we would really appreciate feedback like that so we could incorporate it into our daily operation decisions. And then I'll switch gears and talk a bit about 2015, which is a year that Northern Idaho experienced a record-breaking drought. The lake level was held per statute to the 3.0 feet, but at, at, a, at a consequence, the river dropped to 42.5 CFS on July 28th. So this led to studies that were initiated by the board and they were funded at an amount of $300,000. And the goal of the study was to evaluate strategies to meet long-term water management objectives of the Priest River and the Priest Lake. And as a result of the studies, the recommendation was made for modifications to the dam. And I believe those were funded in the amount of $4.8 million. I'll talk about those modifications in a moment here, but another outcome of 2015 was that the hydrology section from IDWR became much more involved every year on uh, predictions, seasonal level predictions and planning for operations of the dam. So we have uh, Priest Lake uh, dam improvements that were made. They were made to all 11 gates and the, the, the one I really wanted to point out was this six inch gate extension. It's a height increase that allows, allows us to keep half a foot more in the lake so we can hold it from 3.0 to 3.5 feet. We also, because of the greater depth of water, uh, some ribs were added to the back of the gate and the ribs were strengthened to handle the greater depth and forces that were exerted on the gate. Uh, we also had, so those modifications, the whole intent is to be able to store more water early in the season to be able to have more to release later when the river has less flow in it. The other modifications, the, the large, the big picture ones were this concrete apron was extended downstream of the dam and the rock armor was added. And those uh, provide scour protection for large flow events. And then these trunnion pins were all replaced as part of the gate improvement. Only as you can see, the, the improvement here on the downstream side was only completed for half of the dam, and that's what needs to be completed this fall, and the board is working and taking steps to make that happen. Okay. I'll move into operational guidance. It comes in a few forms. The first one is Idaho code that I had mentioned before, 70-507. Again, the, the flow may exceed three feet in spring from runoff, or it's not, not the flow, but the lake level. The, it, we must maintain a lake level between three feet and 3.5 feet during the recreation season, and that was updated in 2018 to reflect that gate height increase. And then other times of year, the lake will be held between 0.1 and 3 feet. The governor holds a water right for recreation storage, and that water right has a priority date of 1927. And it's for 800,000 acre feet of recreation storage in the lake. Another form of guidance is the Idaho Water Resource Board's minimum stream flow water right. And that priority date is 1997. And because the date is later than the, the storage water right, it's junior to that storage water right. 
the, the minimum stream flow water rate is also subordinate to the code for the lake level. So our, our operation decisions are focused on the lake level. That's, that's how that plays out. We also follow the, the guideline to keep flow in the river ab above 60 CFS. That's seen as an absolute minimum that we don't want to approach. Another form of guidance comes from the Priest River Basin Plan, and that's part of the Idaho Water Resources Resource Board's comprehensive state plan, uh, state water plan, and it was amended in 95 and 2003. And those guidelines provide for a gradual release of water, for example, not more than 1,200 CFS of a change from one day to, an, to the next. And fall release to not occur prior to October 1, and if possible, not until the second weekend in October. Also to reach the natural lake level by early November, which had been later specified by Fish and Game to be November 1. So then moving on to daily operations, much of what happens at the lake is not measured. So none of the inflowing streams are measured. Uh, we have evaporation, it's not measured. We have uh, precipitation and runoff. And so anytime the outflow over the dam is not in balance with the other inputs or outputs, the lake will rise or fall. In summer, during a hot, hot conditions, little inflow, no rain, without any gate operations, that lake falls, and it falls quickly. So sometimes you may notice if you're watching the website, the gates are being closed down and the flow's going down, but that is evaporation leading to that. So just to maintain the lake level, the gates are being closed to keep up with that. The gate height modification does provide a new tool that could be, could be helpful, potentially. That is, for example, if we, for every 0.1 feet that we hold in the lake, above three feet, we can release an additional 20 CFS for 60 days. So if we, right now we have the lake at 3.3 feet, with that 0.3 feet over three feet, we can release an extra 60 CFS for 60 days. And that's on top of the flow that's already flowing in the river. So it's an addi additional flow. Those kind of decisions could allow flexibility for releasing water when it might be more helpful for one reason or another. As for operations communications, IDWR sends seasonal level updates to Fish and Game and Department of Lands, Lakes Commission, and the Albany Falls Dam staff. Uh, the Lakes Commission sends out, uh, sometimes forwards our updates to a wide distribution list, and we also update uh, our major plans on our website, public website. This shows the Priest Lake uh, daily average lake level before and after the dam, dams were in place. So the, the purple, go, I don't know if you can, you probably can't see the years. The purple line is before and it goes from 1928 to 1949. And the green line goes from 1951 to 2022. And you can see that the, the lake used to bottom out, reach its natural level around the beginning of October, and that's, <clears throat> that's been pushed out with the holding of the recreation level. It's gone later. We can bring it back. This is an average. 
And then the next one shows the Priest River system before and after the dams were in place. And the years are 1912 to 1949 and 1951 to 2022. So you can see with the orange line is with the dams in place. And so we're falling below what the levels used to be historically uh, since the dams are in place. Um, the flows in October and November are drastically more than they used to be, which makes sense because that's the fall, that's the lake being drained. Uh, one thing to note is that with the ability to hold that extra water over the three feet, it could be used to close that gap and bring the flow up in August and September if that were beneficial. We, we just probably need more agency feedback to know if that would be beneficial. So this going into the recap of the history, in 1927, the storage water right was uh, established by the governor. In 1939, this one's interesting, Northern Lights proposed to build a dam and a power plant. It would have raised the lake 22 feet, but that did not happen. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, 1949, the, the logging was in full swing and the, it was noted that the channel was losing some level and so folks were petitioning to regulate that lake level. 1950, legislature went through and Washington Water Power entered into agreements to operate the dam. And that was for the state as the owner. 1951 to 2002, Washington Water Power continued to operate the dam. Northern Lights was involved for 10 of those years, 1961 to 71, and the first appearance that I ran across of that 60 CFS was in that 1961 agreement for operations of the dam. In 1965, the Idaho Water Resources Board was established, and then the, the board and the Idaho Department of Water Administration com combined to become Idaho Department of Water Resources in 1974. In 1978, the replacement dam went in, downstream of the, the timber dam, and 2002, IDWR and Avista formed an, an agreement for Avista oper to operate the dam. 2011, IDWR starts operating the dam with contracted help and we still continue to operate the dam. The, the board became owner of the dam in 2018 and we still continue to operate the dam as IDWR. So that's a recap of the history in a nutshell and I don't know if All right, well thanks. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I thought Michelle's talk was great. I was worried we weren't gonna clap, so she put a lot of work into that. That was great history. And for the, those of you that work with the Department of Water Resources, you know what a great resource they are. Very user-friendly. The Coeur d'Alene office has been really inundated with adjudication, uh, the Coeur d'Alene adjudication, the adjudication here, and the Palouse River Basin adjudication, and they've been nothing but professional helping people. So just want to give a shout out uh, to them because I work with the department a lot. All right, so that's who I am. First slide, please. All right, who is this guy? You told me to address this, so. Um, so uh, I grew up in Spirit Lake, Rathdrum, um, graduated from school there, uh, went away to the University of Idaho, and, uh, and then found my way to Washington, D.C. and graduated from, from law school there. Uh, just coincidentally, I couldn't find the kind of job in the law that I wanted in this area, and so I ended up in southern Idaho doing water rights work, and I've been doing that for 30 years. Um, I was 
excited professionally when the North Idaho adjudication started because that meant if I had clients, I'd be able to do more work up here. Uh, and I have certainly done that in the Coeur d'Alene adjudication uh, and the Palouse adjudication. Um, I am a part-time resident. Ironically, our daughter who grew up in Twin Falls in Boise got a job as an attorney in Coeur d'Alene. So she got to do that. Um, and her and her husband and our one grandchild, Harper, she's uh, in daycare now. And I got to hang out with her this morning. But so I'm, I'm a part-time resident. I would say 70% of my work is in Eastern Washington and North Idaho these days. So I'm here about half the time in North Idaho. Uh, I did coordinate for today with the Attorney General's office with my former partner, Scott Campbell, who is now on the Lakes Commission and is also the Chief Deputy Natural Resources uh, Division Director for the Attorney General and uh, was my partner uh, previously at Moffat Thomas, uh, where I was before I went to Parsons Bailey. Uh, so I have some idea of what, what he was hoping to cover if he would have been here for the Attorney General's office. So I want to talk about water rights in the basin. There are hundreds of them, so I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of, of I think, uh, higher profile ones. The adjudication process, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and also uh, maybe a little bit about water right administration. Okay, next one. By the way, my, my, yeah, I'm not gonna go there. All right, so this is the adjudication map, Basin 97 and 96. We're in Basin 97, the Priest Basin, and that's what we're talking about this, this evening, of course. All right, next slide. All right, so Basin 97, uh, water rights. What, what are water rights? Um, so this, this is confusing, because you know, you file an application, you get a permit, Eventually it's licensed, eventually a court will look at it, and everything kind of gets referred to as a water right. But the Idaho Supreme Court has had the occasion to define what is an actual water right. What gives you the right to use water? Um, certainly a license, so you've applied, you've got a water right permit from the department, you have now a permit to go out. My water right um, uh, professor used to say, I was a visiting student at the University of Idaho, used to say, this is your permit to go hunt the bear. But it doesn't guarantee you're going to get a bear. So once you bag the bear, you actually develop the water, then the department comes out and confirms that and issues a license. A license is a water right. It is recognized in the statutes as being prima facie evidence of the elements of the right. So if you got a license, that's a water right. Or if it's been uh, there, there was a dispute back in the day. Uh, two folks on a stream had a fight over who had a right to use water, who didn't. It's no license issued or anything like that, but they historically have used the water. The court issues a decree and recognizes what the water rights are of the respective parties. That's happened throughout Idaho's history. That decree by the court is certainly a water right. And then there's a lot of unconfirmed water rights, what I call beneficial use rights. So you use the water historically, before permits were required, and you have always had that use out there, that's a big part of why water right adjudications happen, to confirm or not confirm uh, these unconfirmed um, water rights. All right, it includes two kinds of things, diversionary water rights. So if you look, if you pull up water rights from the Priest River Basin uh, on the IDWR website, which if you've never done that, it's a great tool. It's a little clunky, but it's, a great, it's got a lot of information in it. And when you do the IDWR database for Basin 97, you're gonna see a ton of irrigation and a ton of domestic rights. Water diverted out of the river for use out of the river, diversionary rights, traditional water rights, I'd call them. But also there are these in situ water rights. In other words, the water is used in place in the body of water itself. And we've got those in this basin. So you've already heard about one of those, the governor's water right. It's characterized, as we'll talk about here a little bit, as recreation storage. And you can think about it that way because there's a dam now. But when the right was created in 1927, was there a dam? No. So it really wasn't a storage right. It was an in place in the, the lake right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Very uh, revolutionary at the time because we basically only had diversionary rights in Idaho. Uh, and then you've got these Idaho Water Resource Board rights. Um, interestingly, Indian Creek and Lion Creek, those are both tributaries to the lake. 
Those had minimum stream flow water rights established in 1985, very early. So the earliest water rights for minimum stream flows in this basin were established for stream flows uh, associated with Priest Lake Park and for fisheries related to Priest Lake. Um, coincidentally, the statute that was passed that authorized the creation of minimum stream flow water rights in the first place was in 1978. So the 1985 rights were pretty early. Then there's one on the North Fork of the East River, of the East River in 1990. And then finally in 1997, you get the Priest River minimum stream flow water right, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about that one. All right, next slide. Is my sound working? Okay. All right, so the governor's water right. Coincidentally, all of these water rights will be or have been claimed in the adjudication that's going on right now. So if you filed water rights in this space and you know the deadline's already passed, you can, you can file late if you want to, you can get permission to do that. This water right has not been filed by the Idaho Water Resource Board yet. They've asked for two extensions of time, which the department has granted, but this, this hasn't been filed yet. Um, so we'll see what it looks like when they file it. It is for recreation storage in Priest Lake. It is held in trust by the governor for the people of the state of Idaho. And it was created in essence by the Idaho State Legislature in 1927 under this particular statute. And you can read about it. And it talks about the uses of the lake that the legislature was interested in preserving for the people. It wasn't just recreation. It was all of the, the uses of, of the lake that you can imagine um, even back in 1927. So why, why did the legislature do this? There weren't in situ water rights back then. I mentioned the minimum stream flow statute wasn't even passed until 1978. So why were they doing this in 1927 when all the water rights were diversionary rights? Uh, the reason is, and many of you may know this, there were two competing proposals for uh, irrigation in Eastern Washington, what became the Columbia Basin Project. Uh, one of them was a gravity project where water would be stored in three large lakes in North Idaho, Priest Lake, Pend Oreille, and Coeur d'Alene, and the, the lakes would be artificially manipulated. There was, a, for example, a study that was done in the early 20s, and that's what really precipitated the legislature's action, on dredging Spokane River and Lake Coeur d'Alene so that it could you could, you could store more water and then also take it at a higher level than what naturally uh, occurred on the lake. And it was all for the benefit of the United States that was building the Columbia Basin Project. And the legislature said, no, we're not interested in manipulating our three lakes and turning them into irrigation storage reservoirs for Washington. So the legislature passed this bill that said, Governor, you go apply for water rights for these three lakes to preserve them in their natural state, their natural level, and appropriate all the unappropriated water in those lakes to keep the water in the lakes for the benefit of the people of the state of Idaho, not to store water in an irrigation reservoir for people in Washington. The competing proposal was Grand Coulee Dam that ended up getting built. Uh, why, why would they have even thought about doing this instead of Grand Coulee? Well, if you've ever been to Grand Coulee, and I represent some of those irrigation folks, that's the pump project. They gotta pump water up the hill from Lake Roosevelt, and that's not free. This was gonna be a gravity project. So engineers thought it was really cool. Historical fact, which proposal did Washington Water Power support? Which one did they like better? They liked the gravity project better. I don't know why, but ironically, they now, now buy power from the Columbia Basin Project uh, hydro facility, so it's just a side note. All right, here's the water right um, for uh, Priest River. It is a licensed right also. Uh, as mentioned, it's a 1997 priority for protection of fish and wildlife habitat, aquatic life and recreation values. This one was created pursuant to that 1978 statute, which is important because it limits the ability to own a minimum stream flow water right to the Idaho Water Resource Board. That's the only entity that can apply for and own one of these water rights. Um, it's 21.4 miles from East River to the mouth. I'm not sure everybody's aware of that. It's not the entire length of the Priest River, um, it's, but it's 21.4 miles. And then it has different minimum amounts depending on the time of the year you're looking at. So we're sitting here in July, the minimum stream flow is 700 CFS. 
Uh, it's obviously higher earlier in the season, and goes down a little bit in August until October and then back up. So that's how it was established. Um, by the way, these minimum stream flow water rights in, in essence have to be approved by the legislature. Uh, if, if these go to the legislature and the legislature does nothing after the department approves them, then they go into effect. But they can disapprove of a minimum stream flow, which obviously they didn't do in this case. All right, the next one, please. All right, so there's some really important conditions in the license. Now, why do I mention these are licensed? The governor's water right has been licensed. It's a water right. It's existed in license form since 1928. This water right for Priest River is a license. It's existed since I think the early 2000s is when the final licensing was done. In a license, the director is authorized to insert conditions into the water right. So these are part of the vested water right. Number one, the use of this water uh, right shall recognize and allow the continued beneficial diversion of water under any prior existing water right with a priority of water right date earlier than the date of priority of this right, which is 1997. So every water right in the basin that's earlier than 1997, not just the governor's right, but all water rights um, are superior. This is a water right. It has a priority date. Upon further finding that gauging stations are required to maintain the approved minimum flows, such measuring devices shall be permanently installed and maintained. Now this hasn't been done, but what this is contemplating is that if the director of the department in their wisdom in the future in administering water rights decides that curtailment of junior rights, those after 1997, might be necessary to help fulfill the minimum stream flow, um, maybe not to its maximum, to, you know, to where it needs to be, but to some level, then there could be measuring devices uh, installed and maintained. All right, next one. Okay, so that, that's just kind of the basics of, of you know, how these two, two water rights exist, how they came to be, and the fact that they are water rights, licensed water rights. So what's an adjudication? An adjudication is just a determination of all of the water rights in a river basin in this case, surface and groundwater rights. And all existing rights have to be claimed. So even though you've got a license, it's already been confirmed by the state, you still have to file a claim in the adjudication. And then all of these unconfirmed rights that I talked about where people have used water for 80 years before permits were required, and you know, they've got documentation of some form, hopefully, that they've used this water, those have to be filed in the adjudication as well. Um, at some point, and we're getting close to that point with, with uh, IDWR now, they, they review all of these claims, they put together recommendations in what's called a director's report, and that director's report is filed with the adjudication court. And that's kind of the first actual formal thing that happens in court. Everything up until then is just working with the department to prepare your claim, file your claim, they review the claim, and they will recommend that to the court It'll include all the elements of the right, so who owns it, what's the quantity, you know, what's the source, what time of year to use it, for what purposes, and conditions, that if those are, are pertinent. If you don't like the way your water right is recommended, you can object to it. If you don't like, if you're a claimant in the adjudication, and that's important, you must actually be in the adjudication as a claimant. If you don't like your neighbor's water right, you can object to that. If you don't like the lake water right, you can object to that. If you don't like the minimum stream flow, you can object to that. Now you need to have some basis. And remember, a license has already been confirmed. It's prima facie evidence of the right. It's binding on the state and the parties to that license. So there's limited opportunity to have a credible objection, but you can object if you want, if you're in the adjudication. Eventually, the objections are heard and decided by the court. Um, the department will be along as a technical expert to hopefully guide the parties to a settlement, try to resolve it, but there are cases where, this, where the court will decide and uh, that can be appealed to the Idaho Supreme Court if you don't like the decision of the district court. So th what it is not is an opportunity to relitigate things. So for example, you don't get to change the priorities of established water rights. You don't get to change the conditions that have been established by the department in licenses. But what you can do is, you know, for those unconfirmed rights, certainly uh, there can be disputes about how much, 
for what purposes, the priority date, which can be important as amongst neighbors. Uh, in North Idaho adjudication, very few objections, very few, not, not very many at all. So what the department recommends becomes really important. And the department works with all of the claimants before your right would be recommended to the court, they will send you a preliminary recommendation. Hey, here's how we think your right should be recommended to the court, what do you think? And they give you an opportunity to respond to that before they finalize anything with the court. And then again, if you don't like it, once it gets to court, you can, you can object and talk with them some more. All right, next. All right, the process, I kind of walked through it already, but you file your, your notice of claim, it's examined, there's that preliminary finding they let you know about, and then there's the final director's report that goes to the court, objections and responses, if other parties want to come in and respond to your objection, and then there's actually a special master under the judge who hears the, the case at the factual level and makes a recommendation to the judge, and then that judge makes a decision, and again, it can be appealed to the Idaho Supreme Court. Each water right claim that is objected to in the adjudication is its own little piece of litigation. It can be separately appealed to the Idaho Supreme Court if you don't like it. It's not one giant package for the whole case where you have to wait till everybody's rights are decided. They're what are called partial decrees and you can appeal those if you don't like the decision. Next. All right, so what is the Clark Fork Ponderay Basin adjudication? It's, it's these two basins, 96 and 97, the Ponderay being 96 and the Priest being 97. Claims taking obviously has begun in these five different groups. Last I checked, there's 7,000-ish claims, might be a little bit more now, I think that was from May. And here's the other category, talked about the lake, talked about the in-stream flow in the river, I wanna talk about the federal claims. So Congress passed an act several decades ago recognizing that because the federal government is a large landowner in the western United States, a lot of times these water adjudications move forward People duke it out and get a decision, and a major player is not there, the federal government. And the federal government has water rates associated with different reserves of land, federal land, but you can't sue the king without the king's permission. You can't make the federal government come in. Well, Congress passed this act, the McCarran Amendment, in the 50s that said, we waive our sovereign immunity, you can sue the federal government and make them come into your state court for an adjudication. So they have to file claims just like you, if you don't file your claim, you lose that right. If they don't file their claim, they lose their right. Congress says they have to play in the state court adjudication. So those claims have been filed. They've not been reported to the court yet. And when that happens, the department doesn't review them like they do the state ones and make a recommendation. They just package up and index and send to the court what the federal claims look like and then they have to, the federal government have to come in and prove the elements of their right before the court will decree them. So there's been 15 BLM claims and nine Forest Service claims filed. The deadline has passed, so presumably that's all they're gonna file. Um, that's as between basins 96 and 97. I can tell you from having looked at those, and I know the Attorney General's looking really hard at these, I suspect once they're um, reported to the court that the state, through the Attorney General's office, will object to all of them but um, the ones that they'll be most concerned about are a couple of Forest Service claims. They're purportedly for firefighting, and that's a good thing, but um, looking at the similar claims that, that, that were filed in the Coeur d'Alene Basin adjudication, you look at the face of the claim and it's for an unlimited amount of water from every source of water in the forest in that basin. And that, that just sounds like it could impact other water rights potentially because this isn't a use that actually exists, it's a use that could exist in the future. And unfortunately with Federal Reserve water rights, they don't have to play by all the same rules, they don't have to be existing uses. So anyway, something to watch for and see once those are recommended. All right, so when the adjudication is over, you know what Michelle was talking about even before adjudication's over, water rights have to be administered. So what is that, what is that all about? Well, in Idaho, as you've already um, figured out, First in time is first in right. So if you've got a senior priority, that water right has to be satisfied completely before a junior water right gets a drop. That's, that's the law in Idaho. Um, and that's been well litigated as well. 
IDWR is responsible for the administration of water rights um, and they may adopt rules to, to do that and they've done that from time to time. They had some rules in Basin 34 in the Arco area. There are rules for how to manage surface water and groundwater together, conjunctive management rules. So they certainly have the authority to do rules. Uh, what you see more often is when active water administration is needed in a basin, the director will create what are called water districts. And the water district is a political subdivision, just like a highway district's in charge of taking care of the highways in that area, a water district's in charge of taking care of water right administration in that area. So it's a local unit of government. Um, and it's got specific statutes saying you gotta follow priority. And the water master is, is the person who does that. Okay, the next one. So in North Idaho, have there been water districts? Yes, there have been a number of these. This is right from the IDWR uh, website that lists pages and pages of water districts. You'll notice all of these are inactive except for 95C. 95C is Twin Lakes Rathrum Creek and Michelle's well familiar with that because it's an active deal. They had water rights decreed in the late 80s. One of these neighborhood disputes didn't involve the federal government. There's a dam on Twin Lakes that releases water. There are senior water rights downstream that need to get water. The, the dam and the storage rights in the lake have relatively senior priorities. So there's a lot going on there with administration, people arguing about what that means. And uh, not that long ago, it was in front of the Idaho Supreme Court. And I was arguing on behalf of, of one of the lake water right owners in that case. Um, so it can happen in North Idaho. There aren't a lot of these, um, but there are, are active water districts who the water master will actually go out and fasten shut head gates or whatever he or she needs to do to make sure the seniors are getting their right uh, you know, and the juniors are curtailed when they need to be. Um, even in quote unquote active water districts, a lot of times there isn't active administration until somebody in the basin says, I'm not getting my water and I'm the senior, will you please do something Department Water Resources? And that's how 95C was for quite a while, even though it was active, they had to activate the water master. Somebody had to like say, come on water master, do something. Um, makes some sense because if everybody's getting along and the senior's okay with the way things are, um, the minimum stream flow thing's a great example of that. Um, will the Water Resource Board cur insist that everybody who's junior to 1997 be curtailed or shut off? They don't do that historically. Uh, will it make a big difference to do that? You know, one of the things that the governors had to look at on Lake Coeur d'Alene, because we're right in the middle of that adjudication right now, is even though that's a 1927 priority as well, for the lake. And interestingly there, when that right was created in 1927, Post Falls Dam was already in place. So it is kind of already was kind of a storage right. But will the governor insist that anybody who appropriated water after 1927 that takes some water out for whatever the use is, that they should be shut off in the summer if there isn't enough to be at 2128, which is what the level is there. And the conclusion has been that all the diversions that have occurred since that time, since 1927, aren't enough to make a huge difference. So basically, no, we, we aren't gonna shut people off, but we preserve the right that if somebody comes along with a, a big proposal to divert water, we're gonna be able to oppose that because we have the senior priority and we don't want the lake water rate to be injured. You know, what, what will happen up here with Pondre and Priest and the governor's water right, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. But again, those two rights haven't even been filed yet. So um, that's it for me. I, I'm, I'm shorter than uh, Michelle, my presentation, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I hope that's the kind of background you wanted. Um, yeah. I have a question. Sorry. <clears throat> Last impression. Yeah, I think it meant in the two. I went fast. Yeah, you did. Covered a lot. So if the governor doesn't file. Uh, he will. He just asked for an extension. Okay. Yeah, he will. What would be the consequences if he did? Well, if anybody who has a license right doesn't file, so whoever that is, at the end of the process, um, every identified water right will get a decree. It'll be decreed disallowed. It just won't exist anymore. 
Um, and that happens from time to time. I had a cemetery district up in the Wallace area, had a license rate from 1912, and they just kind of didn't get their claim filed and got decreed disallowed. They wanted to go in and reopen it, and we told them it was a lot easier. Bob Haynes, who used to be in Michelle's position, who's now a consultant, and I said, you know, you can still get water rights in North Idaho, so why don't you just get a new water right? And that was a lot easier than trying to reopen it. Because the state will oppose reopening water rights um, in most cases. I don't know if they'd oppose this one, because since it's the governor's right, but anyway, it'll get filed. But if you don't file, it will eventually be disallowed. So, uh, another question. <clears throat> if, uh, if you were trying to get cold water into the river, either from groundwater or from the lake, would that require a water right? So I've had occasion to talk with the director about this. Um, Any time you divert water from one source and, and put it in on land or divert it to another place, it requires a water right. So if you're going to drill wells, if you're going to siphon water, wh whatever you're going to do. And you notice the word siphon was not in my PowerPoint, OK? Um, or dam, even. Uh, you, you need to have a water right. And I'm, 99.9999% sure of that. I mean, it's, you, you have to have a water rate, which, you know, at the end of the day, it's file an application, it gets published in the paper, people have a right to protest it, it's evaluated under certain criteria, including whether it would injure existing water rights, like the lake right, like the minimum stream flow right, like all water rights in the basin. Is it in the local public interest? Is it in the interest of the people in the area directly affected? That's one of the criteria. Uh, and there are other ones as well. And then a decision's made by the director, it's appealable to court. I mean, it's like the process for anybody else that wants to get a new water rate. I was just wondering if there's a reason for the delay. Delay in? In, in filing those rights. I asked Scott Campbell that on Friday, and he just said there's a lot of internal discussion. So um, if that helps get it right, so to speak, I think it's worth it. Um, the the one for Lake Coeur d'Alene, which granted that was the first of the three to be recommended, um, it was recommended with a subordination provision in it, which basically says, um, even though it's 1927, we're not going to use this to shut off anybody that's come after 1927. Forget the before guys. We know they can't be shut off. But even the guys after 1927, we won't shut them off. And the director put that in the recommendation it wasn't in the license, but it was in the recommendation in the adjudication. And the Attorney General's office, on behalf of the governor who holds this right, in trust for the people of the state of Idaho, said, well, wait a minute, I don't know if that's right. So they object the state objected to the department's recommendation for the governor's water right. So here we are several years later, and you know, of course, that attracted attention. All the folks around the lake that I represent filed a response, wanted to be in there. Avista was interested because they have Post Falls Dam. They filed a response there in there. So we're still several years later trying to get those objections resolved and get the thing decreed. So if, if them taking longer avoids that kind of situation, then it's probably a good thing. But I don't know the reason, and I'm not privy to the reason why um, it hasn't been, they haven't been filed yet. But there's plenty of time still. Yeah. How did it be determined, or are there situations where it has been determined where all of the rights are allocated for a watershed if there's no more rights to be had? Can you tell if a water, uh, all the water's been appropriated in the basin? So the, the director has some tools. Um, he can designate what's, first of all, you can have a moratorium area designated by the legislature. The director can say there's not enough water there anymore no new water rights, with very few exceptions, and he can issue a moratorium order. And we've got those in southern Idaho. There's exceptions, you can get a domestic water right and things like that, but no new, no new big water rights. Uh, there's also a tool called a groundwater management area or a critical groundwater area. It's for groundwater, uh, where the di directors determine that either we're at the le condition or approaching the condition where there's just not enough water for new water rights. And, in fact, we need to look at curtailing juniors uh, to provide water for seniors. So uh, it isn't that we see a designation that this is a closed basin, but a moratorium order is pretty much the, the clearest example that, that we're at that condition that I've seen. And we have that on the Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer in Southern Idaho. We have that in the Big Wood River Basin down in Southern Idaho. 
We don't have that anywhere in North Idaho that I know of. No moratorium orders. So, like I said, we were able to get a new water rate for the um, uh, folks in Wallace. So, so that grass can still be green when people <laughs> go to visit their loved ones. Um, anybody else? I think we're done. We need I think to move we on. Move on. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That was great. All right, we have one more speaker, Merritt Horsman, and he is going to speak a little bit about Idaho Department of Fish and Game's Technical Assistance Program, which I don't know much of anything about. So, but I, I know it has something to do with water rights, a little bit of it. So, hey everybody, I'm Merritt Horsman, and I am um, what's called the Regional Technical Assistance Manager for the Panhandle region of Fish and Game. So same region as uh, Michelle described, it's the five northern counties. Uh, might be a little different, but we, I work out of the Coeur d'Alene office. So I, I put this together um, because I found that many folks in the public um, and even folks within my own department and other agencies don't really understand what we do um, and kind of what our capabilities are and where our place in, in a lot of the processes are. So first off um, is our Idaho Fishing Game mission. And, and that's basically, our mission is to provide wildlife um, and fisheries and make sure that they're preserved, protected, perpetuated, and managed for all the people of Idaho. Um, and in the state there are seven of us. There's one in each region. So we're called regional technical assistance managers. We used to be called environmental staff biologists, but we made the change about a year ago. So, um, <clears throat> so what's the purpose of having a technical assistance manager? Um, we are basically what I like to call jacks of all trades, but masters of none. We take all of the data that's created within the department and we use that data when um, to, to make comments, to make recommendations on projects, on water rights, um, on all the different th parts of development that are going on. Um, so we assemble, develop, curate, disseminate the, all of the, the data that fisheries, wildlife, habitat, all of those bureaus um, gather. And then we put out, um, scientific data-backed recommendations um, to other agencies and out to the public. Um, this is just a quick breakdown of, this was more for internal than external, but of, of our bureau, um, we're, we're under the director's office and what's called the Technical Services Bureau that takes in technical assistance and the IFWIS program, which is the technical part of our program. It's basically a huge database of all of that data. Go ahead. Um, and so the, the dark, I'm gonna use the pointer here. This, this is all IFWIS stuff and this, this is the technical side, but you can just go. I'm gonna go through this kind of quick. It won't be on the test later, so don't worry about it. Um, so that's, our, our, our mission is to take that fishing game data and look at projects and inform conservation decision making um, with technical assistance on projects. Um, so we have three, three parts to our um, program. We've got the IFWIS, which stands for Idaho Fish and Wildlife Information System. If you are doing a project and you need data, those are the folks that provide it for you. You make a data request to the department, um, they send it through me, I'll call you up and say, hey, what kind of data do you need? Do you really need all this data or you just need some technical assistance? Either way, that's where all the data is stored and curated. Um, technical assistance program, that's me. Uh, we, res we respond to requests um, for technical assistance. And most of those come through um, joint permits or water, water right re reviews, requests for comments um, through the county, things like that. 
And then there's the movement and migration program. It's part of our shop and that um, they work on migration and movement of big game, small game, non-game, and how to mitigate negative effects to those through the highway system. Um, so the technical assistance program, you can go to the next one. <clears throat> I like to think of this as a three-legged stool here. Um, so it's really important to, to realize, and, and, and many people don't, and I get a lot of calls, is the only thing that Idaho Fishing Game actually regulates and permits is hunting and fishing. So I get calls, well, hey, you need, to, you need to stop these folks from doing this. You need to stop these folks from doing this. My neighbor's stealing water. A lot of those calls come to the fishing game because folks don't know who else to call. But when you boil it right down, the only thing the Idaho fishing game actually permits and regulates is hunting and fishing and trapping. Um, so we do regulate through harvest management. Um, we collaborate with a lot of other agencies and um, also federal agencies it, through habitat management projects, fisheries habitat projects. Um, and then the last part is we try to influence through recommendations through our technical assistance programs. Um, so we can influence projects so that they don't have negative effects or we can manage some of those and mitigate some of those effects. So this is the test. What does fishing game regulate? Hunting, fishing, okay. So if you have a water right issue, if your neighbor's stealing water, I don't mind if you call you, if, if you call me, and I, I take those calls all the time, but that's really a water resources issue. If your neighbor's driving a bulldozer through a wetland, I don't mind if you call you, if you, if you, if you call me, but we can't do anything about it. That's a, that's a, that's a core issue. So um, we do get a lot of those just because we, we are out there and a lot of people know who we are. So, um, but we just have influence through uh, recommendations on those things. Okay, so what do we do? We respond to proposed actions and policies. Um, we have coordinated state responses, um, and those are state responses to federal projects. So if there's a federal project, say forest planning, the state will coordinate through Parks and Rec, Fishing Game, DQ, Idaho Department of Lands, and we'll take all of those, those agency comments, we run them through the Governor's Office of Species Conservation, and we can comment as a united front, the state of Idaho, all of those comments together, and it's much better than a federal agency receiving comments from several different agencies within Idaho, and some of those may not mesh. So we like to get all of our comments together under the umbrella of the Office of Species Conservation. And it just makes a much cleaner product, especially when we're um, commenting on important federal um, issues. Um, so we apply technical expertise and science-based information, um, coordinate input from programs and subject matter experts. And that's, again, um, most of the folks that um, are in my position across the state. We all have specialties, but what we're really good at is fi figuring out who in our agency is that expert, going to them, getting the information that we need, and collating it through a comment letter. Um, and then our, our motto there is, is, first we try to avoid negative effects to fish and wildlife, minimize the effects, or mitigate those. <clears throat> um, so some of the terrestrial stuff we work on, um, federal policy development to benefit Idaho, ESA stuff, NEPA, forest planning, um, and we work with the, office, the governor's office of um, energy and minerals um, on, on mineral de development projects, wind projects, um, uh, FERC projects. Um, we work with Idaho Department of Trans Trans Transportation on highways, bridges, culverts, and um, 
we help shape land use through forest plans, BLM resource management plans, travel plans, and then on a lower level, county and city planning. <clears throat> so on the aquatic side, we deal with um, FERC relicensing, hydro, hydropower projects, uh, water use, and stream and wetland alteration. Um, up here, we have a lot of, um, we've got a lot of dams. When I, when I moved up here, I was really lucky that all of those have been relicensed right before I got here, so I don't have to do much of that for a while, so good to go there. Um, so water, which we've been talking about today, um, it's, it's definitely political sens politically sensitive at times, um, and we work through our deputy attorney general on those, and then all of our FERC comments go through the governor's office of energy and mineral resources. <clears throat> um, so regional techni technical assistance manager, that's me. Um, we, we use the data and we try to look for solutions that benefit both um, the fish and game, but also the, app or the fish and game, the, the habitat, but also the applicant. So um, we all tend to be, um, look, at, look at stuff through kind of a problem solving lens. Um, and, and try to come out with a good outcome for everyone. Um, so we, we've, we've touched on minimum stream flow, uh, both Michelle, um, bo both speakers tonight uh, on minimum stream flows. And the one thing I wanted to mention on those is um, the development of a minimum stream flow is a very laborious process. It's not just, hey, I think this stream needs this much water in it and we're gonna apply for a minimum stream flow. Um, it took years to, to, to build up the data for those. I made the mistake of, I looked up the Priest River minimum stream flow since Idaho Fish and Game requested that in 1992. Well, as you saw in Norm's presentation, um, it was, I think, a 1997 water right. So it took five years for that process. Um, when I looked it up, I accidentally hit print on the details thing, and it spit out. It's, it's a 200-page document of scientific-based information that went into gaining that minimum stream flow and deciding what the flow should be. So it's quite a lot of information that go into those. Um, we also work with fish screens, not so much in this region, um, but in areas where we have anadromous fish, we have anadromous screen program, um, and we maintain those fish screens so that we don't entrain fish that are migrating out of the system. <clears throat> um, this is from the Movement and Migration shop. Um, in the red here, there's, there's three major areas that we're concerned about for movement and migrations. One of those is the, um, in North Idaho, it's at MacArthur Lake to the north. Um, and we do have some underpasses currently um, that we monitor in, in North Idaho. And um, MacArthur Lake, it, that they're doing a, uh, ID, Department of Transportation's doing a safety project there um, which really worked out for wildlife because they're replacing a little box culvert with a, a longer bridge. And so to augment that bridge and to have um, wildlife use that as a natural area, we're, we're putting up some corridor fencing there. Um, so we work on projects like that. Um, in Osborne, there's a project where there's already a Department of Transportation bridge over I-90 that's never been used before. Um, we are working with the community there who came to us to put in some fencing because wildlife is already using that bridge. So we're just gonna make it a little bit safer and easier for them to use it. And I'm also working with ITD on their Garwood to Sagal project, um, trying to freshen up some of that environmental impact statement that's from the early 2000s because land ownership has changed so much along I-95, a lot of that old wildlife data is not good anymore. So 
We're doing a lot of work on movements and migrations because North Idaho does have some important areas. One more. Um, so this is just kind of a little bragging board um, stuff that we're doing across the state. Um, so we've, since uh, we started as Technical Services Bureau, um, that's been a couple of years, we've put in 155 miles of wildlife friendly fence, um, lots of habitat improvement projects. We've got a lot of telemetry projects going on and mostly in Southern Idaho because um, one, you can, you can work with wildlife much easier when you can fly helicopters and actually see them, um, which unfortunately in North Idaho you can't do. Um, but also that's where our wildlife tends to have those long migration routes. Um, and then transportation projects, again, I, I mentioned some of these. Um, this mule deer crossing at Rocky Point is uh, a really, really important one We've got thousands of mule deer that cross there every year. And I actually started working on that one before I moved up here. Um, we've got a, our first ever big game overpass in the state um, is being built near Lucky Peak. Um, if any of you have ever driven to Salmon um, along Highway 28, you can see this, um, this funnel fence. And I feel much safer driving along there because there was deer all over that road before. Um, Copeland, which is uh, just north of Bonners, we have three underpasses. We get about 1,700 um, wildlife crossings there a year. We've got cameras in each one of those. And we just did an extension because the northernmost um, underpass was not um, functioning as well as we liked. So we're going to hope to bolster that number even more. And then MacArthur Lake fencing project, and then the, the Garwood de Segal environmental impact statement. I, um, we're working on freshening up that wildlife data. Okay, so how we get this done. Um, this is the fun part that now that I took this job, I don't get to do as much, all the field work. This is all the gathering of data, um, and we work to kind of collate that. Go ahead. So um, we get it done by working with the whole department. Um, and you're going to have to do a whole lot of clicks here. I'm sorry. Okay. So first thing is the, the data generation. Um, go ahead. And that's just, just keep just keep it. There you go. OK. Um, so those are all the fisheries, wildlife, enforcement, communications. They're all out there gathering data. They're out doing their projects. And then the data curation. You've got um, folks, fisheries and wildlife, they write their reports every year, the administration of it, and then IFWIS is our, our data curators. Um, then you've got the formation, and, and so reports and data, and some of that is done with the technical assistance program. We, we do help with some of that. And then the last part is the dissemination, and um, so we work with data requests or requests for technical assistance, and we're the ones who are putting the stamp on that stuff and sending it out the door. So um, how, do, how does all this relate to Priest River? What are, what are our concerns up there? Um, first off, there's a map of Priest River with, here's the lake. Um, we have concerns with the temperature of the water. Um, this 18 to 22 C, uh, CFS, 18 to 22 degrees Celsius is near lethal temperatures for, or over lethal temperatures for some of our native Salmonids. So we're, we're worried in, in the priest about that and both water um, temperature and the amount because minimum stream flow that is there is not always being met. Um, but Michelle's been great to work with on that we're in contact a lot on it, and we're working together on, on trying to figure out what's best for fish. Um, it's, a, it's a tough problem because you have this minimum stream flow, but you have a lake full of hot water. So if you look at this map, you've got these tributaries that are cooler than the actual main river, and they've got cool inputs into the system. So would dumping a bunch of hot water from the lake 
just to raise a, a, a minimum stream flow be better for fish? Or would, would fish be better off with lower flow that's cooler? Um, it's something to consider. So um, we've got a really cool life history of bull trout. If y'all don't know that, that's a bull trout. Um, so these bull trout, big bull trout from Lake Ponderé, they actually drop down the Ponderé River, then they swim up Priest River, and then they go up the East River, and they spawn, and then they'll drop back out of East River, back out of Priest, swim up the Ponderé, and go back to the lake. It's a really unique life history. Um, we've actually got a study on it. Have you guys heard about that yet in this group? Okay, we've, we've tagged fish and, and tracked them. It's, it's something you don't see often in the fisheries world. Um, obviously, one of our, our mission is to provide fish and wildlife for the people of state Idaho, so we wanna have a good fishery there. Um, go ahead. Another thing we're worried about in Priest, um, and this is Priest River here, and you can see how it just winds through here, but this whole system on both sides here is a huge wetland system. Um, and those wetlands provide quite a bit of hyperreic flow that comes into the river, and, and that is much cooler than the actual river. So those wetlands help keep the water both cool and clean, and there's a lot of development going on within that. Um, I think there's just three pictures of wetlands. So uh, obviously you've all heard of this wetland. Um, that's the Kalispell Bay Fen. There's one more. Um, and then there's the wetland development on the south end of the lake. All of those have the potential to affect water quality in the lake on a very large scale. And if we allow those to be developed, um, it, many of these wetlands we have in, in, in North Idaho are um, fens and, and peat bogs and if we allow those to be impacted um, and say uh, for the developer to, to, to go to a wetland bank and say, well, I'm just gonna pay into this wetland bank for these, it's like trading a Ferrari for a Ford Pinto. Um, those wetland bank wetlands are, are not as high functioning um, and unique as these other wetlands. So we are definitely worried about the amount of development happening uh, are in and around the wetland areas, and I think that might be. Where are those wetland banks? Well, there's a wetland bank right over there. Um, that's one of them. That's the Pinto. So, <clears throat> and obviously, recreating on the river um, is another thing, having folks be able to use it, fish it. Um, right now, there's currently not a lot of access to the lower river. Um, we'd like to see more people get on that river because the more people get out there and enjoy it, um, the more support you're going to have for any projects that we want to do on there. More people that actually see and enjoy the river. So I have a question. How do you start with the lower manager? Well, we, you, we can't really stop it again. We don't regulate it. So as, as a department, it would, it's difficult for us to stop it. So we go back to avoid, minimize, mitigate. That's all we can do. And so um, we do, I, I try to be res as responsive as I can to those projects and um, talk about wetland values and what negative impacts they have. But it takes more than just our agency to get involved. It takes the public, the DEQ. Um, the Army Corps is actually the one agency that does permit impacts to wetlands. Um, and so they, um, we actually are responsive to them when they ask us for technical assistance as well. But it's hard to stop development. <laughs> you, you mentioned some of the issues with warming of the tributaries and, and 
Uh, how can we cool those down, or or their, would their effect be? Do you see much difference today from, say, 30 or 40 years ago when there was less logging and that's a huge impact of some of our forest fires? Have you seen much temperature variation in strips? You know, we don't have a lot of temperature data, um, historical temperature data, um, but I'm, I think that, um, that right now, the tributaries are some of the only cool water coming into the river. Stuff coming out of the lake is, is warm. So um, I think that there could be improvements. I mean, the whole system is on the warm side compared to similar sized systems. Even in Idaho, if you were to compare, compare that to the Coeur d'Alene system, which the land ownership is a little different on Coeur d'Alene. It's mostly federal versus IDL lands. Um, there's not quite as much logging, but there's fires. There's, there are open basins. It's just a much cooler system. So it's, I think, in general, one of the things um, with the main river is just the, it's open. Um, there isn't a lot of riparian along there. It's incised some, but there are some very cool spring areas and tributary inputs that help cool it down. So, just the Department of Lands is monitoring stream temperature and in some of those watersheds. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if there's somebody from the Department of Lands has come and talked yet. Oh, well, I had to talk. But. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a question for Michelle. She told her. Yeah. Michelle? Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're talking about you know, 1949 and pre-1950. Uh, do you have any data on what the, what you said that the, one of the problems was that the outlet was going down. And uh, so we know what the stream flow was uh, below the below outlet. We, prob we probably have some data. I don't have that right on me tonight, but I'm, it's we're accessing USGS data, so that's something that, that we could look up. And in that same vein, was there much for temperature monitoring with the old dam? Like, the, at, say, the temperature of the lake water above the dam and below the dam with, with the old system when it spilled over? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, there's not much. I mean, how, how long has those temperatures been along? Data, data loggers even been around? I mean, before that, did they just, I don't know how they, I mean, just throw, throw a thermometer away. If they wrote it down, I, I don't know where that information is. Uh, I have, some older data that from pre pre down that I just got and I need to look at. Um, and Michelle has been working with your hydrologist. Yeah. On some of that, trying to figure Our, out. Yeah, we could check with the hydrology section in IDWR and see if we can access temperature data. It might be kind of interesting as, as we move forward and, and study this more, especially when prior to the, the concrete dam, um, how that may have affected it with, with water spilling on the top versus going underneath. Mm -hmm. The amount that it was regulated, I don't believe they could hold it quite as high with the old dam. At least it didn't seem like that. One of the, uh, a really interesting thing that we documented is we took temperature readings from the lake, um, the edge of the lake through Outlet Bay and found that the temperature actually dropped, which is counterintuitive as you got closer to the dam. Mm. And so there's some sort of spring or there's a, also a tributary right there. There's, there's a cold water input near the dam somewhere causing water as it go, flows throughout that bay to cool. Mm. Is that so. Lamb Creek, Roy? Yeah, Lamb Creek comes in uh, about 800 feet above the dam. But you still got about 12, 1400 feet from there up to the actual outlet. Um, but there's no, if, if there is any kind of input, it'd be an underwater source. 
But uh, we, we live right here. And I've got, I've got, a, I've got a fish finder, a couple things. Uh, and that is typical when we take our boat out, the water there from the dam up to the, to the outlet is typically three to five degrees cool all summer long unless it gets extremely hot. Right. There's a lot of current in there too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, we thought that was pretty interesting. So, we don't know where it's coming from, though. <laughs> and Michelle, you mentioned that your, you have the ability to keep the lake inches higher in order for those releases, and that working with other agencies to determine what that release might look like would be helpful. Right now, are you just making that decision based on the lake level and its needs. And yeah, I'm, it's I'm basing it on just trying to supplement flow later in the season in August and September just to bring the flow up. But if, if that's not beneficial to all the goals, to reaching all the goals, then, then we'll just have to keep trying things out. But that's, that, this new system allows flexibility. Right. So I, I think we just need some data from agencies spelling out when or if supplemental water from the lake will be beneficial. I have a, I have a question. You said that there's going to be uh, more construction on the dam in the fall. What are they doing? They're finishing up the concrete apron and the rock armor on the southern side of the river. So they only finished it for half of the gates. Now they're doing the other half. And what's the magic about November 1? November 1 is according to Fish and Game. It's kokanee spawning. <laughs> you know, they're worried about if, if, it, if you let it down um, slower, if kokanee spawn in shallows, then you just dry up their nests. So that, that's why that November 1 date is there. So that appears. Uh, yeah. Is the litigation settled on the dam issue? I can't talk about that. Do we know so. for sure that, that they're going to be working on it this fall? Um, that, that is the plan, but again. Somewhat subject to these cases. October 1 is still a hard day. That's the plan if if construction is indeed happening. And if it doesn't, then? If it doesn't, I'd, I'd still like to have an earlier drawdown just to reach that November 1 date. So that I'm tending towards that date. I know it hasn't always been done that way, but. I think we locked it up over 10 last year. It's been pretty historic on that. I know in, in our location, we're one of the northernmost spawning beds up above Granite Creek, and it seems like over the years we're, we're seeing many fewer and fewer kokanee in the shallow spawning. It's water left seems to be pretty much in the deep water, but we'll, no matter what the lake level is at. But I don't know if, if, if the lake were held higher for longer, if some of those surviving fish over the sea over their lifespans would move closer to the shore. I mean, they only spawn once, but right. could they teach their eggs to spawn closer to the shore? Well, we found in Pondre, it's the same thing. You've got shallow spawners, you got deep spawners. Um, we don't know why they, they do what they do other than substrate type. Um, and so it might be that we just selected and priest over the years for deep spawners, which um, if that's the case, then Maybe we don't need to drop the lake level so much, but it's. Do you try to, to uh, lower under eight, same time frame, November 1st? That's a, that's a large drawdown. It has to 11 feet or something like that. Yeah, the, we don't have as much input on a federal dam as we do on a state dam, no. so. So they're not concerned about the company? Yeah. No, it needs to be at its winter pool by November 15th. November 15th? Yep. And, oh, sorry. 
<laughs> I understand. So come back, you go. Um, um, Craig Hill sent me pictures, I don't, can't remember what year it was, but it was 2016, 2017, showing the coping and spawning on the shoreline. And his message at the time was just to the idea that once you start the lowering of free slave, that it just should happen very quickly so that it gets to its winter level sooner and then the opening can spawn at that level. So it's the same scenario with Fonda. Um, just to get it where it's going to be before and so that they, they aren't left high. Um, and so then the concern was, well, are you, is there too, if you release it very quickly to meet, to have that happen quickly, are there too, is there too much CFS in the river downstream? And everything I ever heard back on that was that you really can't, that really isn't a problem with the people on the Priest River are the high CFS. It's just sort of typical. Um, isn't there kind of a scouring effect though? I mean, I'm sure, there, well you have the 1200 CFS rule, I just learned That was in the Priest River Basin Plan. <clears throat> Yeah, so you can't be releasing more than that. Right. And we never come that close, even close to that. We're just changing two, three hundred CFS at a time and then letting it stabilize and then later that day or the next morning changing it again. I remember. Um. Can you, is there any play in the change, just, well, we, I, we've heard, we've had conversations about how quickly the water levels drop on the river in the spring. Um, and so is there any, and, it, and that fish can get stranded and it, and the, it can be that quick to have detrimental effects to make things in pools that are warming up. And, um, is there any play in there, any capability to, slow that process. Yeah, there's flexibility in how fast we do that. We're, again, we're trying to do, you know, affect a couple, CF, couple hundred CFS at a time. And so, yes, if we had the feedback, we could work with it okay. and affect our operations. We, we just haven't had the data yeah. to yes. know. I just didn't know It's kind of interesting to see in your graph, um, Michelle, where, where it showed the pre-dam water levels as, as they peaked in the season and came down. And looking at, if I saw that correctly, we, the lake was dropping very drastically during August to a much lower level than, than we, of course, we hold it now. It's, it's interesting, I guess, in the sense that we did have kokanee then, and so apparently that must have had some impact on their survivability because the lake was completely down before they're spawning the season. But, um, I don't think we want to do that. No, <laughs> that sounds too early. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the spring, in the spring um, that, that Aaron was referring to, the spring runoff, uh, the lake is actually way above uh, three and a half feet. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, I imagine that the river is flowing, well, I know it's not. I can see it. It's pulling oh. really good mm -hmm. in the spring until you until you reach until the lake uh, sort of settles down and settles into that three and a half. Yeah. I, I can know because I can tell you I can't even use rocks. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You do. You don't just put the cork in the bottle all of a sudden with that either. No, we're trying to gradually do it. It might seem quick, but we have flexibility, so. Keep the feedback coming. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle, do you know if Outlet Bay has ever been dredged for sediment or is anyone in 1950 and current? Have there been episodes where there's been some dredging, maybe some sediment trapping issues? I'm just I might ask Roy. Do you What's know Roy? Question? Oh, any sediment accumulation in Outlet Bay that's needed dredging or have there been concerns with that at all? Uh, years? Since the dam got put in. <laughs> There's no no indication, no record of any kind of dredging that's happened. Uh, one of the things that 
that used to be common uh, you know, in the early logging days was they put up a temporary dam, float logs down, some coal, Southern Iowa, and go high water, they blow all those dams and run logs all the way to Reese River or wherever they were going. So that had a major impact on stream banks and all the other aspects of the river. Um, right at the outlet, it is very standing. There was a core sample taken several years ago right off the bank of the, right at the end of the dam. Most of that ground in there is clay and sand. There's quite a few rocks in there. Um, but uh, we live right oh, about 900 feet up, upstream from the dam. And uh, I haven't really seen any kind of siltation or anything other than we got lots of pollen and all that stuff. And since the water does slow down in there, you do get a little bit in there, but as we start opening uh, the flow back up in the fall, that all cleans out the, uh, the, the gravel in there starts to appear again. So um, I don't have anything to say, yeah, there is a silt problem. I know there is a silt. There isn't, but uh, you know, I haven't um, noticed it. Yeah. You know, I, I think just uh, uh, by able to, when we open, open the gates in the fall, uh, right upstream from the dam, those rocks are a little hard to see because all the pollen and sand and stuff. And once the river spawning again, it clears out. Yeah. yeah. A question, and, and it's maybe you know, the only will answer it for me. Um, the river drops significantly about July second or third, overnight. You know, with this this it has dropped a foot since uh, second. I put a marker out there mm -hmm. to see where the level was, and I've been taking pictures every day. I've been on the river since I uh, started June twenty seventh, and for about a week. It stayed exactly the same. There was no drop, no drop, no drop, no drop. And then July, I think, 2nd, it drops six inches. And then since then, it's dropped another, it's been a foot. It's dropped a foot since July 2nd. It seems to me, now maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that all of a sudden, the 4th of July is coming, and all of the people that want to use the lake are wanting the lake at a certain level, and the dam. Couldn't couldn't it be couldn't couldn't the water be held back over a longer period of time so we don't see such a drastic drop so quickly because okay so it had to do with that chart with the the blue oval representing the lake and the inputs and the outputs and the outflow and it all comes down to what lake level are we trying to maintain and what evaporation is happening. So it's really just about the lake dropping as evaporation happening, and we have to close the gates if we want to maintain a certain lake level. So that's, that's what that was. So I understand that part of it is evaporation. Yeah. So the river's going to, even if there were no dam, certainly this time of year, the river is going to drop. Yeah. That's just nature. Uh, my, my, my concern is it drops so quickly right around the 4th of July. Yeah, so it was just year. a coincidence. Probably just the weather shifting <laughs> right around then. It could be the end of all the runoff about that time, too. Start to stop getting that influence about that time of year. But so you said there's flexibility in certain situations. I'm just curious if there would be flexibility in the future, too allow the lake to go down a little bit during that time to allow for the river to drop more slowly and not strand the fish? <laughs> or because the lake has the senior water rights, would that be like a thing just for litigation? Is that 
So there's flexibility. We have flexibility to operate between 3.0 and 3.5 feet. So if we, if the guidance from, you know, all of you and agencies is to allow the release of that lake level and to, you have to basically decide when you want the release to happen. Is it going to happen earlier in the season or later in the season? But once you let it go, we're not getting it back. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Well, it seems like you could get it back slowly over the months following. It wouldn't, come, it wouldn't come back because you have to close the gates so much to get the lake to come back up, it would be that the river would just not be flowing anymore. No. So really it's when, when is it best to have the flow through the outlet dam, earlier or later? I'm remembering I wanted to clarify, did you say the 0.1 inches? I guess that's Point 0.1 feet, yeah. One feet, sorry. Uh, is 60 CFS for 60 days? Point 0.1 feet is 20 CFS for, for 60 days. And point 0.1 feet is about an inch. It's roughly an inch. It's one point. 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 It's yeah, and I, I just think it would that, <laughs> that decision making would be based on so many variables. Yeah, each yeah. year, the temperature, the rainfall, all, all spring runoff timing. I mean, each year you would just have to have a set of parameters that you knew you wanted to meet, and then apply those conditions. And then if you let it go early, there's a risk of having a drought too, and then the lake levels. Right, you start screaming that the lake level went down. Yeah, there would have to be a very thorough hydrologic study right. projection, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you have enough? I think it could be done. Do you have enough uh, data on the operation of the dam at three and a half foot level to no. know? No. No, this, so that height increase happened in 2022, and that last year was the first year we had that to even start experimenting with it. So this is the first summer that we've held the lake higher than it's been. We're at 3.3 now. Have so. We, have we been able to maintain 60 CFS? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's working. Well, it's we not in the heat of the summer. We haven't gotten to the, yeah, the hardest part of summer yet. Well, it rained today up there, so. <laughs> 